Jem Neuer was born in uh, Dunbar, Scotland. His parents, Anne and Daniel, um, both from this local north eastern part of lowland Scotland on the, uh, on the ocean, um, operated a small store. Um, Daniel was a widower who had um, remarried to Anne, and John was their first child. He was not brought up in a happy household, though. His father was very strict. He belonged to a very conservative uh, form of the Baptist church, and he believed in punishing kids, the physical punishment. His father was severely religious, and uh, by the time Muir was between eight and 10 years old, uh, his father had forced him to memorize the entire New Testament and most of the Old Testament. His grandfather, who lived across the street from them in uh, Dunbar, uh, was much kinder than his own father. And he took uh, John Muir on his first walks in nature, showing them, you know, birds' nests and, um, you know, where they might find mice and in the hay, you know, and help them uh, understand, begin to understand the nature that was all around them, that he loved all of his life. In 1849, uh, Daniel Muir, Muir's father, moved the family uh, from Dunbar to uh, Portage, Wisconsin, to what had been previously completely unbroken land, where he bought an 80-acre tract of land near where other Scots were also settling. And um, they came to Wisconsin because they heard that there was good soil here, and his father uh, Daniel Muir wanted to farm. They found that they were in a place that was just endlessly beautiful and natural and where no white men had lived before. I was set down in the midst of pure wildness where every object excited endless admiration and wonder. The first thing he and his brother David did was they loved to climb the trees and started finding bird's nests. They loved the flowers, they loved the birds, they loved the wildlife they saw. And as far as they were concerned, they were just in some sort of biblical paradise. And he, he, they, the boys worked very hard on the farm. They did a lot of, the, uh, of helping with the plowing and digging and, and um, and, one, and, the, and John actually dug a well and almost died because there was a buildup of CO2 in the bottom of the well and he wasn't getting enough oxygen and they had to, you know, put, send down a, a bucket and pull him up. So he was, uh, he was definitely, definitely not a pampered young man. As a child, Muir was not so much interested in the preservation of wildlife, not yet, because at that time he hadn't really been exposed to the kind of degradation of natural areas that he saw later in life. As a child, he wasn't so much interested in what he called, in what we call wilderness. To him, the word that always comes up is wildness. He loved the wildness of nature whether it was a storm or wild animals or nature, you know, both the death in autumn or the, the new life in spring. It was the wildness of nature and the beauty of nature. And he was immediately able to see as a child the connection between the spirituality, the religion that was imposed on him by his father and what he saw as God's nature. He continued to speak of God all through his life, but he was never particularly, as an adult, um, conversant in the same kind of religious themes that we talk about when we specifically talk about religion. He saw God in the rocks. He saw God in the trees. He saw God in plants and animals and birds. Uh, so it was really as a child, a love of the 
beauty of wildness. When he was 21 years old, he had been encouraged to set off to the university to the annual state fair where he was encouraged to exhibit the inventions that he had been creating, clocks, thermometers that he had made out of washboards and wagon wheels and old gears from farm equipment. You know, he was very inventive and he, um, uh, he took some of his inventions out to a, a show in Madison and they attracted a lot of attention. And um, then he decided that he would go to the university without much help, financial help from his father. During his time at the university, he met a student named Milton Griswold, who really fired up his love of botany, of plants. And one day Muir came out of the, out of North Hall, and there was Milton Griswold standing beneath a gigantic towering locust tree. And he said, uh, Muir, do you know what kind of a tree this is? And he said, well, no, I'm afraid I don't know that much about botany. He said, well, look at the leaves and look at this flower. What does it remind you of? And Muir looked at it and he said, well, it looks to me like a pea plant. He said, exactly. He said, the flowers and the leaves, and he showed them, you know, the stamens and the pistils and the flowers and how the seeds were aligned and compared how the, the pea plant, which is a scraggly vine that grows up things, and this gigantic locust tree were so very similar in the way that they were designed, if you will, by nature. Well, Muir thought this was absolutely fascinating and describes how thereafter he began running during his free time during college out into the nearby woods and prairies and really looking much more closely at plants and seeing how they were created. And all of this combined uh, really impacted him and convinced him that he wanted to just devote himself to the beauty of nature and bringing the whole story of nature and God and science all together. And he decided to visit California. I think in, the, in those journeys, uh, he had a lot of time, as he said, botanizing, and, and he got very interested in how the some of the, the uh, valleys and ravines were formed, and his theory was that it was by glaciers. And then he sets off across the, Saint, the great central valley of California and sees in the distance the Sierra Mountains, the great range of light, and visits the famous Yosemite Valley. So he was interested in all parts of nature. He felt a kinship even with rocks, with plants, with animals. So he, he kept that feeling. I mean, he was a true preservationist. And he did have sort of a falling out with Gifford Pinchot, who believed, as most Americans did, and, and probably people around the world, that nature was provided for us to use. And um, he believed in controlled, he believed in saving trees, Pinchot did, but he believed in controlled uh, lumbering. And uh, Muir thought that was wrong in these beautiful places like Yosemite needed to be protected. And he worked very hard on that and was successful ultimately. Preservation became a subject of intense curiosity to both him and others in the West. So he started getting involved with politics and he would meet politicians and inf people influential in Washington, D.C. and began in the 1880s to attract people to the idea of creating uh, preservation areas. And a lot of people, be, people began to hear about him and, and interesting and and influential people came to see him. 
he met Emerson. Emerson uh, came to, um, uh, to Yosemite and also camped with him and really urged him to come, you know, come to Massachusetts, join society, you could be more influential. But John Muir just found it difficult to give up being out in nature. Uh, by the time 19, the early 1900s came along and Theodore Roosevelt was president, um, the movement was really afoot to resist the ruination of the Sierra Nevada mountains, other areas that became national parks like Grand Canyon and Yellowstone. And in 1902, uh, Roosevelt actually came as president and uh, met with Muir in San Francisco, then traveled with him to Yosemite Valley. And there's a great story of how they were going to have a big banquet. The presidential party was there. They'd all arrived on the train and you know all these uh, official events were planned. And Muir and Teddy Roosevelt actually snuck away on horseback with just a couple of extra helpers and a few horses of supplies. And the two of them camped together in the mountains, in Yosemite Valley, uh, awaking one morning to newly fallen snow, which at first Muir was worried that, you know, no, here I've gotten the President of the United States out here in the middle of nowhere, and now we're buried by this major snowstorm. Well, Roosevelt thought it was absolutely wonderful and had just a fantastic time. And later that year, um, the decision was made to add Yosemite Valley to the new national park system. And it was um, really the culmination of Muir's preservation efforts. Later in his life, um, he was very much involved in, an, in the vain attempt to preserve another valley near Yosemite. And there was a plan afoot to dam up the Hetch Hetchy Valley as a water supply for the city of San Francisco. Muir and others were horrified by this idea, uh, thinking that other sources of water could be gotten for San Francisco. And it was a, the last great political struggle and brought great heartbreak uh, to Muir when it failed. But perhaps this heartbreak was what did in John Muir. He was 75 years old, and uh, when the decision was made, uh, he didn't live very long uh, thereafter, dying of pneumonia in a hospital in the tiny town of Los Angeles, California. Had there been no Wisconsin, for John Muir. There would have been no John Muir for the world. For it was here, growing up in the pure wilderness that he found when he first came to the Fountain Lake Farm. All the way through his studies at the university where he learned science and botany and chemistry that he began to see the interconnectedness of all nature that was the theme of all of his later life and work. Muir's greatest accomplishment to many people will be the creation of the national park system. He's called the father of the national parks, the founder of the Sierra Club. But it might truly be said that his love of wildness is what inspires so many people today to preservation. And it's not just an effort to preserve what exists, but to see into the heart of nature is indeed Muir's greatest legacy. Aldo was born on January 11th, 
1887, and he was, his family was living on the buff, bluff lands of Burlington, Iowa, which was on the Mississippi River and the, the migration pathway of many birds. And his parents were Clara Starker Leopold and Carl Leopold, and they came from very rich family lives themselves. And they bro both brought this love of the land, she in gardening and he in the hunting and fishing. So the, all this came together in this very rich family soil for Leopold. <clears throat> so Aldo grew up with all this love of the land and doing both the hunting and the gardening, bird watching and um, fishing. Well, Leopold's family was relatively well-to-do. His father ran a furniture uh, business. So they did uh, have the resources to, to take luxury family vacations to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. That probably would have been an interesting uh, trip in the early 1900s because uh, the train trip would have, of course, taken them through uh, the clear cut of the late 19th century. So. Leopold would have seen firsthand on the trips back and forth to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan the, uh, the devastation of the North Woods from, from the Great Lakes states. So he grew up um, and that was his kind of vacation paradise. Not that he wasn't tramping around and going hunting and fishing where he was, but that was their special island place. And he would map out the island. He loved to map and to name things for himself and to really get that feeling of, I am an adventurer. So he did that on the island as well. When you read his journals, you wonder how in the world he managed to get such good grades because he was literally out bird watching and hunting and fishing all the time. But he decided to devote himself to a career in the sort of new emerging field of conservation. Aldo decides, I want an outdoors career. I want to go into the Forest Service, this new adventurous profession that hadn't even existed before. So he ended up going in a preparatory school out east, Lawrenceville, for part of his high school years to make sure he'd be ready. And then he went to Yale for the forestry schools. Well, as soon as he graduated, literally, he was hired by the U.S. Forest Service and headed off immediately um, for the Southwest. His assignment was in the Arizona and New Mexico territories. They weren't even states then. Um, so he was going to be working in fairly vast areas of public wild lands uh, in the Southwest. That was his first experience being out west, and so he got himself a horse. I mean, you know, he had to have a horse and he had a saddle and his 10 gallon hat and he was a um, timber cruiser. So what the timber cruisers would do is they would go on these kind of reconnaissance things and he had to do surveying and he wasn't very good at math. That was the one subject he wasn't very good. So he often, his surveys weren't really good, <laughs> but he was paying attention to the land. So he actually was surveying to cut the trees down, which in later in his, his career, he would go more against clear cutting and everything else. But at that time, that's what the principle was. And then they would just replant it with single species trees. Um, he also started to look at the forest that he was managing in a, in a different way than uh, the traditional forestry training um, had led him to. Instead of thinking of the national forests as just a simple supply of forest products, Leopold started to realize that these were ecosystems and that they needed to be managed uh, more holistically than just a source of, of raw materials coming out of the forest. So at that time, he did that, and that's at the time period when he ended up shooting a wolf, a mother wolf. And that was where he has the famous quote. So I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean a hunter's paradise. But after seeing the fierce green fire die, 
I knew that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. And it had stuck with him, that look that wolf gave him before dying. And I don't know that there's any record of him ever shooting wolf again after that. So something hit him even then. And at that time, he was really looking into how do we preserve game? He formed some organizations in Arizona and New Mexico um, to promote wildlife conservation. He was on the stump very frequently writing and speaking about wildlife conservation. And during this time, um, he was starting to realize that some of the training that he had received as a forester could be directly applied to wildlife management. So he would sketch, <clears throat> he would take notes on which birds came, he loved the wrens when they show up. So he would, he would start tracking when the birds would come and when they'd leave. He married Estella in um, October of 1912, and they had five children. They had Starker, the eldest, then Luna, then Nina, and then um, Carl and Estella. And they all became really significant people nationally and internationally for their work in various aspects of land, water, wildlife preservation. And in 1933, um, Leopold was offered the opportunity to um, occupy a chair in game management at the University of Wisconsin. Extremely important um, event because it was the first time that wildlife management, wildlife conservation had ever been included as a field of study at a university anywhere in the world. His first thing is to go up to the Boundary Waters, a new wilderness that they want to preserve. Loves it. Just thinks it's fabulous. And then he's in a lab and the guy is like, oh my God, I'm stuck in a building all day with smells and formaldehyde and everything else. They're taking wood chips, making plywood, all these new products, fabulous stuff they create. But him, oh my gosh, he's needing the air. He can't even breathe, he's so tight in. Leopold now, of course, is in the second phase of his career. He will spend the rest of his career at the University of Wisconsin uh, pursuing his interests in wildlife conservation, but as he has steadily uh, through his career, rapidly evolving to think about bigger and bigger um, issues. And what he did is he scientifically connected the loss of habitat to the loss of species. So not only is it over hunting, no habitat, you have no game. And he was able to prove it and show it with scientific things. Well, Leopold, um, throughout his, his uh, time back in the Midwest in the 1920s and early 1930s, um, had always maintained some sort of a, of a retreat for hunting. Initially, uh, it was a shanty on the current river down on the Arkansas-Missouri border. By 1935, after he was at the University of Wisconsin, he decided to look for a place closer um, to Madison. And this was at a time when uh, many marginal farms were uh, failing. Farmers were walking away from the land, leaving it tax delinquent, so that there were really quite a few properties around south, southern, and central Wisconsin uh, that could be acquired basically as, as tax delinquent land. He found just this ruined land in Adams County along the Wisconsin River. And he decides, it's got an old chicken coop on it is all, but you know, we can make this into a hunting shack. And I always <laughs> try and imagine what Estella must have thought as they drive to this new land and he shows her a chicken coop 
and it had not been cleaned out of all its leavings. And she's, he's like, yeah, this is, this is our thing we're going to buy. And you have to wonder, well, why did he do that? Um, certainly the fact that the Wisconsin River was adjacent to the property was one attractive feature. But in fact, it was probably the unattractiveness of the land uh, that appealed to Leopold. This was at a time when Leopold was starting to make um, a major contribution in the area of ecological restoration. He was starting to think about how to heal damaged land. Those acres on that Wisconsin River, they then set forth to recreate through the shovel. And they began bringing in thousands of pines and all these trees they planted. And there were some apple trees left from an orchard, so they had those, they left those. So they used the, the things of the land to get this shack in shape. His greatest accomplishments there were to process and bring in that philosophical meanderings of his mind as the land is community and to start processing that in essays. Um, Leopold was encouraged to be a skillful writer as a, as a young man and he certainly did become um, a very uh, good writer and a very convincing writer. He puts together his essays about the land and his experiences on it. And so he goes, it's called the Sand County Almanac because of how it goes um, first January, February, you know, goes through a season at the shack with what he observes of the land. And then the second part, it, um, he brings in essays from different places, essays from here and there, you know, where he had taken time um, on his other trips and what he'd seen on his other trips with the land. And the last part was the upshot. What, what does this mean? And you see him building this philosophical groundwork. And he comes to his land ethic, which is, a thing is right only when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the community. The community includes the soils, waters, fauna, and flora, as well as people. A thing is wrong when it tends otherwise. So that was his, his land ethic and all the reason for it. Well, Leopold, um, in 1948, um, he was 61 years old. Um, you might say, really, he was uh, sort of reaching the, uh, um, the pinnacle of his career. I mean, he, by this time, was quite well known as a leader of the conservation movement and um, was, was, was writing some of his most significant um, publications about conservation. Tragically then, just uh, shortly after he received notification that a Sand County Almanac was going to be published, he and his family were up here at the shack on a, a nice spring day in April. And they're up there and a local farmer who was kind of partners with them on a lot of projects and, th you know, a, a neighbor who needed help had a, had a fire. So they all went to go help put out this fire, and Leopold had a heart attack. After the fire was out, um, no one knew where Aldo was, and um, he was discovered um, at the scene of the fire. He had suffered a heart attack, um, had apparently laid down, uh, laid his tools next to him, and um, died of a heart attack. The fire then uh, sort of swept over his body, um, but he was discovered after the fire was out, and uh, that ended obviously a, a life that was certainly cut short at age 61.
Um, he still had many more productive years ahead of him, and um, it's interesting to imagine what he might have been able to accomplish if, if he had lived longer. So the legacy he has and this concept of harmony is a difficult one because if you come from it from the point of view of absolutism on any approach, you can't get there. It's caring and coming to know the land and to love it, and you can't do that if you're not outdoors. And that was probably the most enduring um, thing that he has left us today. So he tried to show people how we have to build an ethic in our culture. Howard Litcher was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. At that time, Shorewood was a new development and they lived on um, one block off from Oakland Avenue, two blocks off from Capitol Drive. So this meant that they were in between the Milwaukee River and Lake Michigan. He did a lot of playing down by the river and he had a lot of friends that, that really enjoyed doing that. They'd swim, um, they would just mess around the way kids used to mess around down by the rivers and uh, pretty much right away had a love of nature and being outdoors and doing a lot with his, he had a brother two years older than him and they did a lot together. Children at that time were able to roam with no supervision and Howard loved this. He was able to take his fishing poles, his jackknife in his pocket, even matches, probably material to build the rafts that they made to float on the river. And uh, family stories are that uh, a couple times the two of them had built a raft and were on the Milwaukee River and ended up somehow in Lake Michigan and the Coast Guard had to rescue them. And by the, after the second time they went to my, to my grandmother and said they would not rescue them again. The children swam in the Milwaukee River which was very, very polluted. One of the neighbor girls contacted typhoid fever from swimming in the river. And I believe this had a great effect on his thinking about the environment. It, that really made a huge impact on him. He would talk about it quite often and um, felt that that, you know, they needed to protect those rivers. They needed to keep people safe. They needed to stop the dumping and uh, the pollution going into these rivers. This was before the age of sewage disposal plants. Everything went into the river. The importance of the water of the rivers and kids playing there and fish coming out of them was a huge environmental problem for him. So that's where a lot of his efforts went into. In 1950, he moved to Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and became involved in the environmental movement early on. He joined the South Shore Conservation Club, which was a club that was mainly interested in fishing, and so water quality was a big issue with them. There were 10 conservation clubs in the area of Fond du Lac. They joined together to form the Winnebago Land Conservation Alliance. The South Shore Club focused on water as they, their issue. So they began investigating the feeder streams that went into the lake so Howard began to lobby for cleanup of those areas. When our children were young, 
We liked to hike in the area of Hobbs Woods, which was a natural area. Two streams came out of the quarry that met together to form Parsons Creek. The waters in this creek were poor, pure enough for a trout stream. And we did fish in the stream and look for flowers and enjoy a peaceful feeling of nature. I really um, had a great time going out there. We do a lot of hiking and there were a lot of wildflowers and trees and the, of course the creeks were absolute fun for us. Um, and I think that's when he decided that that area really needed to be protected. Um, rumor was that they were thinking of putting a housing development in there and he didn't want to see that happen. He didn't want to see that loss. This prompted him to start a movement for the purchase of the land. The Alliance was very interested in this project. They began to raise money and public awareness. Howard spent many hours giving talks to local clubs and interested people. To raise money, a button was made to sell by groups such as the 4-H Club and other interested people. Donations were asked from businesses and other groups to raise the complete purchase price. That was probably the biggest conservation, in my opinion, um, interest of his was to get Hobbs Woods kept as a nature area for families like ours to go out and enjoy and, uh, and use over and over again. You could use it in summer. There was cross country skiing in winter. Um, it was just a great place to go. It still is. He did a lot more than Hobbs Woods. He was um, very involved. He served as a delegate to, a delegate to the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. Um, that was about 1973. He was the president of the Environmental Quality Council. He was president of Fond du Lac Doers. Howard still had an interest in the Milwaukee River. He joined a group from the Milwaukee area that had a pro project to restore the Milwaukee River. He often went to the meetings down in Cedarburg. This prompted him to think about the Fond du Lac River, which had become very polluted and full of garbage and debris. A group was formed called the Doers to clean up the river. I think it was about Earth Day time that this was organized. Many people came with their boats, grappling nets, young children. I can remember going out on a day and with some friends and they had a whole group of people involved in this and they cleaned up the river. They went in and they pulled things out. I can remember them pulling out tires and tin cans and I mean, and you name it, it was in that river and then going around and cleaning all that up off the river banks and, and recycling what could be recycled and getting the rest where it needed to go. Howard was elected to the city council in 1974. At this time, there were many environmental projects going on. The city realized that they could no longer use this dump. It was on the area called Stinky Point, and no wonder it was called Stinky Point. That odor wafted all along the north end of Fond du Lac on windy days. They started a new sanitary landfill to take care of this problem. 
not only was the dump there, but there was uh, this old sewage disposal plant. They decided they needed to put up a new water treatment plant, and he was very involved in that. So that was going to be out by Lakeside Park there, and that made a huge difference in the amount of pollution that went into the Lake Winnebago. I can remember how he spending hours on the research on this plant. The city council voted for both of these projects. Close to the dump was an area called Soupley's Marsh, which was a good fishing area and an area for small animals. There were people in the city who wanted to develop it into more of a tourist area. They wanted to fill in the marsh. They wanted to put in a golf course, uh, hotels right near the lake there. But my dad and a couple of the other people on the city council wanted to keep it as a nature area. They just thought it would be too big of a loss. Lakeside Park was actually filled in and because it was marshy also at one point. He didn't want to see that happen. He wanted to keep it natural and so that everyone could enjoy it. The council voted to buy the property and leave it in its natural condition. The only improvements they made was to install a new road and boat launching ramps. Because of Howard's leadership in these projects, the road was named Howard Litcher Drive. He had uh, received some awards from the city also and some of the, uh, the, some of the councils. In about 1972, he received the Fond du Lac Reporter Ecology Award. The Fond du Lac Reporter is the newspaper, the Fond du Lac newspaper. And that was in recognition of his, the many cons conservation related activities he was involved with. Also, he received an award from the Fond du Lac County Natural Beauty Councils and that was around 1973, and that was because of all of his efforts in, for Hobbs Woods, keeping that as a natural area. He passed away in July of 1975 of a heart attack. We had so many people show up for that funeral. They were actually out the door. There was a line out the door. They, people really had a respect for my dad, and those who knew him knew that he put so much into what was what what he enjoyed and a lot of that was the outdoors and so conservation was very important to him a lot of the reason you know it wasn't a per, just a personal reason he was involved in doing so much but he wanted to make people aware that we were losing a lot of land and we, it was not going to be recovered and he wanted to keep that for other generations and wanted other people to realize how important it was that we have the land available to us, that the land's available for the animals and the birds and the flowers and that it, it's not being disturbed. Once it's disturbed, it'll never be the same. So he, he wanted to make people aware how important it was, not just for himself, but for everyone.